Live from San Jose, California, it's theCUBE. Covering Big Data Silicon Valley 2017. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live in Silicon Valley for Big Data SV, Big Data Silicon Valley in conjunction with Strata Hadoop. This is the week where it all happens in Silicon Valley around the emergence of the big data as it goes to the next level. The Cube is actually on the ground covering it like a blanket. I'm John Furrier, my co-host George Gilbert with Wikibon, and our next guest we have two executives from Zaloni, Ben Charma, who's the founder and CEO, and Tony Fisher, uh, SVP of Strategy. Guys, welcome back to the Cube. Good to see you. Thank you for having us back. You Thank guys you. are uh, great guys. You're in New York for Big Data NYC, um, and a lot is going on certainly here, and it's just getting kicked off with Strata Hadoop. They got the sessions today, but you guys are already got some news out there. Um, Give us the update, what's the big discussion at the show? So yeah, I mean, 2016 was a great year for us. A lot of growth, uh, we tripled our customer base and a uh, lot of interest in data lake as customers are going from, say, pilot and POCs into production implementations of Hadoop. Um, and in conjunction with that, this week we launched uh, what we call a solution uh, named Data Lake in a Box, appropriately. Right, so what that means is that we're bringing the full stack together to customers so that we can get a data lake up and running in eight weeks time frame with enterprise grade data ingestion from their source systems hydrated into the data lake and ready for analytics. So is that a pretty big box and is it waterproof? <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, this is the big discussion <laughs> yeah. now with that, pun intended, but yeah. the data lake is evolving. So I want to get your take on it because this has kind of been a, a theme that's been leading up and now front and center here on theCUBE already. The data lake has changed. Obviously we've heard, I mean, Dave Vellante, I think in New York said, you mm -hmm. know, data swamp, but using the data is critical out of the data lake. So as it goes to the more mature model of leveraging the data, like what are the key trends right now? What are you guys seeing? Because this is a hot topic that everyone's talking about. Well, that's a good distinction that we like to make is the difference between a data swamp and a data, data lake. And a data lake is uh, uh, much more governed. It has the rigor, it has the automation, it has a lot of the concepts that people are used to from traditional architectures, only we apply them in the scale-out architecture. So we, we put together a maturity model that, that really maps out a customer's journey throughout the, the big data and the data lake experience. And, and each phase of this, we, we can see what the customer's doing, uh, what their trends are and where they want to go, and we can advise to them the right way to move forward. And so a lot of the customers we see are kind of in what we call the ignore stage. I'd say most of the people we talk to are just ignoring. They're, they're, they don't have things active, but they're doing a lot of research. They're trying to figure out what's next. And we want to move them from there the next stage up is called store, and, and store is basically just the sandbox environment. I'm going to stick stuff in there, I'm going to hope something comes out of it, no collaboration. But then moving forward, there's the managed phase, the automated phase, and the optimized phase. And, and, and our goal is to move them up into those phases as quickly as possible. And Data Lake in a Box is, is an effort to do that. To, to leapfrog them into really a managed data lake environment. So that's kind of where the swamp kind of analogy comes in because the data lake and the swamp is kind of dirty where you can almost think, okay, the first step is store it. And then they either get busy or they're trying to figure out how to operationalize it. And then it's like, uh, to your point, they're trying to get to that. So you guys get them to that st setup and then move them quickly to value. Is that kind of, is that the approach? Yeah, so time to value is critical, right? So um, how do you reduce the time to insight from the time the data is produced by the data producer till the time that you can make the data available to the data consumers for mm -hmm. analytics and downstream use cases? So that's kind of our core focus yeah. in bringing these solutions to the market. You know, David Voth and I were talking, George always talk about the, the value of data at the right time, at the right place is the critical you know, linchpin for the value, whether it's an app driven or whatever. So the data lake, you never know what data in the data lake will need to be pulled out and put into either real time or an app. So you have to assume at any given moment there's going to be data value. Sure. So that conceptually people can get that, but how do you make that happen? Because that's a really hard problem. How do you guys tackle that when a customer says, hey, I want to do the data lake, I got to have the governance, I got to know who's accessing stuff, but at the end of the day, I got to move the data to where it's valuable. Sure. So the approach we have taken is um, with an integrated platform with a common metadata layer. Metadata is the key. Mm -hmm. So using this common metadata layer, being able to do managed ingestion from various different sources, being able to do data validation and data quality, being able to manage the life cycle of the data, being able to generate these insights about the data itself 
so that you can use that effectively for data science or for downstream applications and use cases is critical based on our experience of taking these applications from, say, a POC pilot phase into a production phase. And what's the next step once you guys get to that point with the metadata, because I could get that, everyone's yeah. got the metadata focus. Now I'm, I'm the data scientist, or data engineer, which is three, you know, data engineer, the geek, the super geek, then you get the data science, and then the, the analyst, and there'll probably be a new category, mm -hmm. a bot or something, AI will do <laughs> something. But you can have a spectrum of, of applications on the data side. Yeah. How do they get access to the metadata? Is it through the mach machine learning? Do you guys have anything unique there that, that makes that seamless, or is that the end goal, or? Sure, you want to take that? Yeah, sure, it's, it's a multi-pronged uh, answer, but I'll start and you can jump in. One of the things we provide as part of our overall platform is a product called MICA, and MICA is really the kind of own ramp to the data. And all those people that you just named, we love them all, mm -hmm. um, but, but their access to the data is, is through a self-service data preparation product, and key to that is uh, the, the metadata repository. So all the metadata is out there, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, we call it a catalog at that point, and so they can go in, look at the catalog, uh, get a sense for the data, get an uh, understanding for the form and function of the data, see who uses it, see mm -hmm. where it's used, uh, and determine if that's the data that they want. And, and if it is, they have the ability to uh, refine it further, or they can put it in a shopping cart, if they have access to it, they can get it immediately, they can refine it, if they don't have access to it, there's an automatic request that they can get access to it. And so it, it's this sort of uh, on-ramp concept of having a card catalog of all the information that's out there, how it's being used, how it's been refined, uh, to allow the, the end user to make sure that they've got the right data uh, that can be positioned for their ultimate application. Yeah, and just to add to what Tony said, because we are using this common metadata layer and capturing metadata at every mm -hmm. instance, if you will, uh, we are serving it up to the data consumers using a rich catalog so that a lot of our enterprise customers are now starting to create what they consider a data marketplace or a data portal within mm -hmm. their organization so that they're able to catalog not just the data that's in the data lake but also data that is in other data stores and provide one single unified view mm -hmm. of these data sets so that your data scientists can yeah. come in and see is this a data set that I can use for my model building? What yeah. are the different attributes of this data set? What is the quality of the data? How fresh is the data? And those kind of traits, so that they are effective in their analytical I journey. think that's the key thing that, that's interesting to me, is that you're seeing the big data explosion of the past 10 years, eight years, we've been covering at theCUBE since the Duke world started, but now it's a data set world, so it's a big yeah. data set in this market. The data sets are the key, because that's what data scientists want to wrangle around with and sling right. data sets right. with whatever tooling they want to use. Right. Is that kind of the same trend that you guys see? That is correct, and also what, we also, uh, what we're seeing in the marketplace is that um, customers are moving from a single architect to a distributed architecture, where uh, they may have a hybrid environment with some things being instantiated in the cloud, some things being in on-prem. So how do you now provide a unified interface across these multiple environments, and in a governed way, so yeah. that the right people have access to the right data, and it's not um, the data swamp that you Okay, so let's work. go back to the maturity models. I like that framework. So now you just complicated the heck out of it, because now you got cloud yeah. and on-prem. And then now, how do you put that prism of a maturity model on now hybrid? And so how does that kind of cross connect there? And then second follow up to that is, where are the customers on this progress bar? I mean, I'm, I'm sure they're different <laughs> by customer, but uh, so maturity model to the hybrid and then trends in the customer base that you're seeing. All right, I'll, I'll take the second one and then you can take the first one. Okay, so, so the vast majority of the people that we work with and the people, the, the prospects, customers, uh, analysts we've talked to, other industry dignitaries, uh, they put the vast majority of the customers in the ignore stage, you know, really just doing yeah. their research. So, so, so a good 50% plus of, of most organizations are still in that stage. And then the, the data swamp environment that I'm, I'm using it to store stuff, Hopefully I'll get something good out of it. That's another 25% uh, of, of the population. And, and, and so uh, most of the customers are there and we're trying to move them uh, kind of rapidly up into a managed and automated 
uh, data lake environment. The, the other trend along these lines that we're seeing that's pretty interesting is the emergence of IT in the big data world. It used to be a business user's world, and business users built these sandboxes, and business users did what they wanted to. But now we see organizations that are really starting to bring IT into the fold because they need the governance, uh, they need the automation, they need the type of rigor that they're used to in, in other data environments and has been lacking in the big data. And they got the IoT code, cracking the code on the IoT side, yeah. which is create another dimension of yeah. complexity. Yeah. Um, on, the, on the numbers of the 50% that are ignored, I could, uh, is that profile more Fortune 1000? Um, is it, it's, it's, it's larger companies. Larger yeah, companies. It's, it's uh, Fortune, yeah, Fortune Global 2000. Yeah. Got it, okay. Yeah. Um, all right, and the terms of the hybrid yeah. maturity model, <coughs> how's that? <coughs> and, and throw out your, they had a third dimension, IOT. Yeah. You've got multi-dimensional <laughs> chess game going on here. Yeah. So I think the way we think about it is that there are different patterns of um, data sets coming in. So they could be batch, they could be files, or database extracts, or they could be streams, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as you think about a converged architecture that can handle these different patterns, then you can map different use cases, whether they are IoT and streaming use cases versus uh, what we're seeing is that a lot of companies are trying to replace their operational analytics platforms mm -hmm. with a data lake environment and they're building their operational analytics on top of the data lake, right? So you need to think more um, from, an abstract, uh, from an abstraction layer, how do you abstract it out? Because one of the challenges that we see customers facing is that they don't want to get sticky with one cloud service provider because mm -hmm. they may have yeah. multiple cloud service yeah. providers. It's a multi-cloud so world yeah, right now. Yeah. So how do you leverage that where you have one cloud service provider in one uh, geo, another cloud service provider in another geo, and still being able to have an abstraction layer on top of it so that you're so do you guys have the, So do you guys provide that uh, data layer across that abstraction? Is that the that strategy is correct, you yeah. take? So okay. we leverage the ecosystem, but what we do is at uh, the data management and data governance layer, we provide that abstraction so that you can be on-prem, you can be in cloud service provider mm -hmm. one or cloud service provider two, you still have the same controls and same governance yeah. functions as you build your and data And this is consistent with some of the cube interviews we had all day today and, and other cube interviews where when you have the cloud, you're renting, you're renting basically, but you own your data. You've yeah, got to have absolutely. a nice, and that metadata seems yeah. to be the key. That's the key, right? That's uh, right. For everything. Yeah, yeah. And now what we're seeing is that a lot of our enterprise customers are looking at bringing in some of the public cloud infrastructures into their on-prem environment as they are going to be available in appliances and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So how do you then make sure that whatever you're doing in a non uh, enterprise cloud environment, you are able to also extend it to the enterprise. And the cloud consequences environment. to the enterprises that they got to run multiple jobs if they have don't have a sure. consistent data layer. It's just yeah. more redundancy. Exactly, and uh, not redundancy, yeah. duplication. Yeah. I should say. Yeah, yeah duplication yeah. and yeah. difficulty of, of, of rationalizing it yeah. together. Yeah. 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 So. so let me drill down into a little more detail on the transition between these sort of maturity phases, um, and then the movement into sort of production apps. Mm -hmm. um, I'm curious to, to, to know, like, um, we've heard, you know, like Tableau, um, Excel, uh, pa um, Power BI, mm -hmm. um, uh, Click, I guess, being uh, sort of adapting to being front ends to big data. Sure. But they don't, you know, w to pr for their experience to work, they can't really handle big data sets. Mm -hmm. So you need the MPP SQL databases mm -hmm. on, t on the data lake. Mm -hmm. Um, and I guess the question there is, is there value to be gotten, or measurable value to be gotten just from turning the data lake into, you know, uh, interactive BI kind of platform? Yeah. And, and sort of as the first s sort of step along that maturity model. Yeah, so I mean, one of the patterns we are seeing is that serving layer is becoming more and more mature in the data lake, so that earlier it used to be mainly batch type of workloads. Now with kind of MPP engines running on the data lake itself, you are able to connect your um, existing BI applications, whether it's Tableau, Click, Power BI, and others, to these engines, so that you are able to get low latency query response times, and are able to slice and dice your data sets in the data lake itself, right? But you're essentially still you have to sample the data. You can't handle the full data set unless yeah. you're working with something like a um, Zoom data. Yeah, so there are 
physical limitations, obviously. And yeah. then there are also this next generation of BI app, uh, tools which work in a converged manner in the data lake itself, right? So um, there's uh, like Zoom Data, Arcadia, and others that are able to kind of run inside the data lake itself instead of you having to have an external environment like the other BI tools. So we see that as a pattern. But if you already are an enterprise, you have onboarded a BI platform, um, how do you leverage that with the data lake as a next generation data, uh, part of the next generation data architecture is a uh, key trend that we're seeing. So that your metadata helps make that um, from swamp to curated data lake. That's right, and I mean, not only that, so what we have done, as Tony was mentioning in our MICA product, we have a self-service catalog, so, and then we provide a shopping cart experience where you can actually um, source data sets into the shopping cart, and we let them provision a sandbox, and when they provision the sandbox, they can actually launch Tableau or whatever the BI tool of choice is on that sandbox, so okay. that they can actually, and that sandbox could exist in the data lake, or it could exist on a relational data store or an MPP data store that's outside of the data lake um, that's part of your modern data architecture. Okay. But further further to your point, if, if people have to throw out all of their decision support applications <coughs> and their BI applications in order to change their data infrastructure, they're not going to do it. Understood. So, so uh, you have to make that environment work, and that's what uh, Ben's referring to with a lot of the new accelerator tools and things that will sit on top of the data lake. Guys, thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. Really appreciate it. I'll give you guys a, a, the final word in, uh, to end the segment. Um, what do you expect this week? I mean, obviously, we've, we've been seeing the consolidation. You're starting to see the swim lanes of, with Spark and open source, and you see the cloud and, and IoT colliding. There's a huge intersection with deep learning. AI is certainly hyped up now beyond all recognition, but mm -hmm. it's essentially deep learning. Neural networks meets you know, machine learning. That's been around before, but now freely available with cloud mm -hmm. and compute. And so kind of an interesting uh, dynamic that's rocking the big data world. Your mm -hmm. thoughts on what we're going to see this week and how that relates to the industry? Yeah, I'll take a stab at it and okay. Tony, yeah. feel free to jump in. So um, I think what we'll see is that a lot of customers that have been playing with big data for a couple of years are now getting to a point where what worked for one or two use cases now needs to be scaled out and provided at an enterprise scale. And so they're looking at a managed and a governance kind of layer to put on top of the platform, right? So that they can enable Mm -hmm. machine learning and AI and all those use cases because business is asking for them, right? Business yeah. is asking for how they can bring in TensorFlow and run on the data lake itself, <laughs> right? Yeah. So we see those kind of requirements coming up more and more frequently. Awesome. What, what he said. Okay, got <laughs> it. And enterprise readiness certainly has to be tables. There's a lot of table stakes in the enterprise. It's not like easy to get into. You can see Google kind of just putting their toe in the water with the Google Cloud, TensorFlow, great highlight. They got Spanner. So all these other other things like latency, <laughs> these, these are rearing their heads again. Right. So these are all kind of table stakes. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing moving forward with respect to machine learning and, and some of the advanced algorithm, uh, algorithms, what we're doing now and some of the research we're doing is, is actually using uh, machine learning to manage the data lake, which yeah. is a new concept. So when we get to the optimized phase of our maturity model, a lot of that has yeah. to do with uh, self-correcting and, and self-automating yeah. data I mean, lake I need some machine learning and some AI, so does George, and, <laughs> we, need, and we need machine learning to watch yeah. the machine learn, yeah. and then <laughs> algorithms for algorithms, it's a, it's, a, it's a crazy world, exciting time. Are we going to have a bot <laughs> next time when we come here? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're working on a chatbot from Messenger, we just came from South by Southwest. Guys, thanks for coming on theCUBE. Great insight, and congratulations on the continued momentum as Loney. This is theCUBE, breaking it down with uh, experts, CEOs, entrepreneurs, all here inside theCUBE, breaking down big data SV. I'm John Furrier, George Gilbert. We'll be back after this short break. Thank you.